As someone that grew up only having watched the Lord of the Rings movies, Gimli wasn't a character that I thought about a whole lot. He wasn't hot like Aragorn, or snarky like Legolas, or kind like Sam. He was just funny. So imagine my surprise when I had last picked up the books and found Gimli to be a character who was, yes, humorous at times, but also wise, eloquent, and highly respected by his companions. It left me wondering, how did this happen? How did this eloquent warrior poet become, well, this? So today, I am going to endeavor to answer that question and identify the differences between book Gimli and movie Gimli and talk about the impact that these changes have on the character and the story as a whole. Now, despite what I believed as a child, I would now probably say that Gimli is one of the most important members of the Fellowship. He's the token dwarf of the Fellowship, but also really the only dwarf that we fully meet in the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. There are plenty of hobbits for us to get to know. There are lots of humans to compare and contrast. Even Legolas is far from the only elf that we meet in the story. But Gimli is the only dwarf that we meet up close and personal, and that makes his characterization incredibly important. Like it or not, in the eyes of the audience, Gimli will be the dwarf, and so his personalities and tendencies will be reflective on dwarf kind as a whole. And in the books, Tolkien uses this to his advantage, and through the character of Gimli, he paints a lush and thorough portrait of dwarven culture and attitudes. Tolkien's Gimli pulls from an old old and noble tradition, going all the way back into ancient Norse and Germanic mythology. His dwarves are heavily inspired by creatures called Dolkalfar, or Dark Elves. They are put there as a contrast to the Yosalfar, or the Light Elves, the fair and heavenly creatures that would go on to birth Tolkien's elves. The Dolkalfar, by comparison, were less lovely to look at and dwelt underground. The myths behind these creatures are a little bit nebulous, but they usually took on the form of the helpers to the hero, crafting them weapons and treasures to take along on their journey. Tolkien used this, as well as other mythological threads, to create his dwarven race, to be the other side of the coin to his ethereal, magical elves. Now I know where your mind may be going here, because nowadays dwarves have taken on very particular characteristics, especially when they're placed in comparison with elves. Elves are considered elegant, beautiful, cultured, and pretentious. Dwarves, by comparison, are loud, brash, hedonistic, and stubborn. They love drinking, eating, and fighting, and are almost always the butt of the joke. What's really interesting to me is that despite being the father of modern fantasy and birthing many of these modern fantasy races, that's not what Tolkien's dwarves are like. His Gimli, as the exemplary dwarf, is a far more nuanced character, at odds with elven culture, but in a far less ham-fisted way than most modern fantasy dwarves. So let's take a look at him as he's presented in the Lord of the Rings book, and how Tolkien constructs his dwarven characteristics. But before we get into that, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. Languages were a foundational part of Tolkien's art of culture building. So if you want to immerse yourself in new and exciting languages, you should check out this video's sponsor, Babbel, one of the world's top language learning apps. Babbel is a language learning app that is scientifically proven to get you started speaking a new language in just three weeks. Their lessons are designed by real language teachers, and you can do them anywhere, anytime, right on your phone. Woher kommen Sie? Woher kommen Sie? Du kommst aus Polen. I've loved using Babbel to refresh myself on German since I started learning it in high school and just kind of lost most of it when I graduated. And now, ich spreche English und auch ein bisschen Deutsch. If you want to start using Babbel and begin working towards your language speaking goals, you can use the link in my description to get yourself 60% off your subscription to Babbel. It's such a fantastic deal for a whole lot of learning, so make sure you give it a look. Thanks so much to you guys for checking out my sponsors when I have them, and a huge, huge thanks to Babbel for sponsoring this video. And now, 
back to Gimli. We first see Gimli as unwaveringly loyal, even to the point of stubbornness. Before the Fellowship departs Rivendell, when there's little more than words and vows binding them together, he protests Elrond's suggestion that this quest may test their loyalty as a group. Gimli argues that now that they've given their word, they will not stray. He says, Faithless is he that says farewell when the road darkens. Maybe, said Elrond, but let him not vow to walk in the dark who has not seen the night fall. Yet sworn word may strengthen quaking heart, said Gimli, or break it, said Elrond. This conversation demonstrates the very particular loyalty of dwarves. Because in reality, Elrond isn't wrong. The Fellowship has no idea what they're going to be facing, and despite all their vows, the Fellowship is not able to hold true to their path. Elrond is wise, nuanced, and correct. Gimli, however, is not able to see these carefully contemplated shades of grey. To him, a vow has been given, and that vow alone, bolstered by sheer force of will, is enough to keep him loyal. And in Gimli's defense, he's also not wrong. Despite the fact that other members of the Fellowship, you know, push and break the words of their vows, Gimli remains very consistently true to his word. His vows continue to push him forward even long after the Fellowship has been disbanded. Although he plays a somewhat small role in the actual plot events of The Lord of the Rings, he is an ever-present force, pushing Aragorn and Legolas forward in their journey to save Merry and Pippin from destruction. He is the burning coal at the heart of the Fellowship, keeping the flame alive through just force, will, and dedication. But beyond just bullheaded loyalty, Gimli demonstrates a very unique appreciation for the beauty of Middle-earth. Dwarves had a special connection to creation and beauty, fostered in them by their own maker, Aule, who they called Mahal. Mahal had created the dwarves out of a burning desire to have something to pour his love for making and creating into. He wanted to share his craft with somebody. Thus, dwarves were created with an innate desire to create, to make beautiful and marvelous things, and to wonder at the glory of creation around them. We see this quality shine in Gimli, who is often drawn to wax poetic about the marvels that he's seen. We find this in the glittering caves behind Helm's Deep, and also in his unabashed admiration for the beauty of the elven queen Galadriel. Any ancient rivalry between elves and dwarves is immediately forgotten in the face of her unsurpassed beauty, and when offered by her anything that his heart desires, Gimli says that the only thing that he wishes for is to have seen her and to have heard her fine and fair voice. She presses him, and Gimli says, There is nothing, Lady Galadriel. Nothing unless it might be, unless it is permitted to ask nay to name, a single strand of your hair, which surpasses the gold of the earth as the stars surpass the gems of the mine. He explains that his only desire is to treasure this gift to set it in crystal so that it might remain the most honored heirloom of his house for eternity. Galadriel is so moved by his words, by the purity of his admiration, that she cuts off three of her hairs for him to have. This moment is particularly remarkable, considering that Galadriel's hair has long since been a pretty hot point of contention. Long ages before the events of the Lord of the Rings, the elf lord Feanor approached Galadriel. He was enraptured by the beauty of her golden hair, and wanted a strand of it to be used in the creation of his Silmaril gems. He begged her three separate times, but each time, knowing that Feanor was unwise and rash, Galadriel sent him away empty-handed. And yet, faced with the earnest, frank attention of Gimli, Galadriel gives him her hair and two more strands than he had even asked. Tolkien is telling us that dwarves may be different from elves, but they are equally as admirable, and in some cases, even more honorable. And here's the thing, these positive qualities about Gimli, and thus about dwarfkind as a whole, are never, like, contested by the film. Gimli is dedicated to the journey, and he's able to talk Galadriel into giving him some hair. But they chose to let these traits, which define him in the books, take a back seat to, well, the 
classic modern fantasy dwarf tropes that we talked about earlier. To be honest, I am kind of curious as to where this modern fantasy dwarf came from, because it is such a truly cemented idea in our modern culture, and it, you know, it definitely didn't come from Tolkien. If you guys have any ideas or any leads, do let me know, because I will be doing a full video about that sometime. To be completely honest, I am not sure why they chose to sacrifice the complex and fascinating character of Gimli with angry Scottish man with beard trope, but I, I think there are two major possibilities. First off, there's the one that everybody thinks of. They needed a comic relief character. And on one hand, this is an obvious element to the decision that they made. Gimli is inarguably the most comedic character in the trilogy, especially if you just look at the sheer proportion of jokes to serious moments that they let him have. Like sure, Pippin and Gollum are funny characters, but I would say that the proportion of serious emotional moments far outweighs any of their goofs and gaffes. But Gimli is almost always given one-liners or set up as the slapstick punching bag at the expense of his character development. So yes, he is the comic scapegoat, but I don't think that's all of it. I also just think that the filmmakers were scared to try and represent his original character. It is kind of a hard sell. The trope of angry Scottish man with beard and an axe was really firmly cemented into the cultural idea of dwarves at the time that these films were coming out. A lot of people were probably just expecting to see that on screen when Gimli rolled up onto the screen, especially if they hadn't read the books. And it takes time and care to develop the layers of a character like Gimli, especially in the amount of time that they had to do it. It was probably just way easier to flip the character, give the audiences what they wanted, and get a few good jokes in there in the meantime. And that's why even though movie Gimli technically hits most of the plot beats that he does in the books, the tone that these scenes are written in fundamentally alter the way that the character develops throughout the story. So let's talk about a few specific instances. First off, we have Moria, and in the movies, Gimli strolls into those caves with all the confidence of a blustering peacock. Soon, Master Elf, you will enjoy the feeble hospitality of the dwarves. Roaring fires, malt beer, red meat of the bowl. This, my friend, is the home of my cousin Bali. And they call it a mine. A mine! Here, the filmmakers are leaning back on the classic food and drink obsessed braggart dwarf tropes. Meanwhile, in the books, Gimli really couldn't be a lot more different. After Sam calls the caves mere holes, Gimli corrects him singing him the Song of Durin, which contains the remembrance of Moria that once was. A king he was on carven throne, in many pillared halls of stone, with golden roof and silver floor, and runes of power upon the door. The light of sun and star and moon, in shining lamps of crystal hewn, undimmed by cloud or shade of night, there shone forever fair and bright. The Fellowship listens with rapt attention, demonstrating once again that Gimli's adoration for beauty and craftsmanship is something admirable and respectable. Now, if you compare this scene to, hey, Legolas, they got meat and beer, it really couldn't be more of a night and day difference. They replaced a scene that demonstrates the depth of Gimli's character and the wonder of his dwarven culture with a one-off meat gag. Later, when they find Balin's tomb, we get this scene. Oh, no. And of course, I am all for men strongly expressing their emotions, but if you compare it to what we see in the book, you can tell that they've really thinned out his character. In the book, they find the tomb and Gandalf goes up and reads off of the plaque. They read what it means, that Balin is dead, and Gimli simply raises up his hood as a sign of grief. And that's basically all that we get from him. He puts his hood up as a sign of mourning, an acknowledgement of what's been lost without needing to rely on a big emotional display. It's in line with the character that Tolkien has developed, 
a sensitive yet emotionally intelligent person who knows how to express their feelings without necessarily wearing them on their sleeve. And then we come to his most character-defining arc within both the movie and the books, his relationship with Legolas. The two begin at odds, considering that elves and dwarves are ancestral enemies, a rivalry built on thousands of years of bad blood. And both mediums show us the journey of the two of them going from being rivals to friends. And in the movies, this is demonstrated largely through snarky banter. Despite his protests, Legolas saves Gimli and Moria by grabbing him by the beard. Legolas offers to get him a box because he's too short to see over the wall, and then Legolas drinks him under the table in Rohan. And you may have noticed a bit of a pattern in these examples. Most of their on-screen relationship building is just Legolas making jokes at Gimli's expense. Through this edgy banter, they come around in the end being willing to die side by side as friends, and that's very nice but it's a far cry from the relationship that we see in the books. They begin as blood rivals, of course, but their growing relationship seems not based on, you know, snark and banter and insults, but rather on camaraderie. Legolas breaks Gimli out of his fog of grief at the tomb of Balin, pulling him to safety. Despite the fact that Legolas hates being underground, using his words, Gimli is able to convince him to come back and see the splendor of the glittering caves, and they basically plan on going on a road trip together, seeing Legolas' favorite sights and Gimli's together. Their friendship develops naturally, out of trust and companionship, and they learn what is good and and admirable about each other's races. The best example of their different relationships in each medium comes after the Battle of Helm's Deep. In both stories, they compete to see who can slay the most enemies, and in the aftermath of the battle, they compare their numbers. In the films, this concludes with yet another snarky interaction. Final count, 42. 42? Oh, that's not bad for a pointy-eared elvish princeling. <laughs> I myself am sitting pretty on 43. <laughs> 43. He was already dead. He was twitching. He was twitching? Cause he's got my axe embedded in his nervous system! Legolas seems unable, or at least unwilling, to concede the victory to Gimli, and while it's a funny scene, it hangs on to a lot of very prickly tension. The books, meanwhile, play out very differently. 42, Master Legolas, Gimli cried. How is it with you? You have passed my score by one, answered Legolas. But I do not grudge you the game. So glad I am to see you on your legs. Rather than playing the sore loser, Legolas is happy to admit defeat if it means that his friend is safe. It's less outright comedic, but it demonstrates a much deeper level of care and affection between these characters. Rather than propping up facades of contempt between these characters and thus effectively their races, it shows how these ancient blood rivalries can be broken down by the power of friendship. Overall, I think it's obvious that Tolkien and Peter Jackson were trying to build very different types of characters. Tolkien's Gimli is exemplary of the dwarven race. He is loyal to a fault. He's a poet with an eye towards all that is beautiful and open-minded enough to heal a racial divide thousands of years in the making. Peter Jackson's Gimli, meanwhile, is the brave and mostly kind comedic punching bag. He likes to drink, he likes to eat, and he likes to put himself in situations where Legolas can make fun of him. He's a bit silly, a bit superficial, but in the end, I think hard to not like. Now this is probably coming across like I just hate Gimli from the movies, and, and that's not true. I, I think for what he was trying to be, he's quite enjoyable. John Rhys Davies and Brett Beatty did a good job of playing him. He's fairly charismatic and He's very funny. But when it comes to the original character, as always, there are limitations to adaptation. It's a shame that his original character had to be completely lost, and I think the depth and nuance of his character and the dwarven race as a whole is sorely missing from the finished film. I think I would say that Gimli is one of the characters that got done dirty the most by Peter Jackson's team. 
even possibly beating out Faramir, but I would be curious as to what you guys think. Because at least with Faramir, they tried to give him some of his, like, original motivation and, like, basic characterization, but I feel like they lost almost all of that with Gimli. So please do, let me know what you think in the comments. This video topic was actually picked by my patrons, so if you want to suggest video topics or talk to me about upcoming videos or videos that are already out, like this one, you should check out my Patreon, which is linked right in the description. And I truly, truly appreciate any of you who have checked that out or any of you who have signed up for that because it really, really helps me out. But if the Patreon's not for you, just liking this video and subscribing do an awful lot to help me out here. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope that you have a very happy, hobbity day. Mm -hmm.